So let me tell you uh, a little bit about uh, Jeff. I, I got this short bio right here. All the yellow is what I, what I was going to tell you. Uh, <laughs> what, you is, what is not highlighted is what I, it, these are words I can't pronounce. It's like reading the back of a Twinkie Wonder. <laughs> you know that together they are good. They make this thing last for 100 years on the ground. But uh, anyway, uh, he is actually a geologist uh, who graduated from Stanford University. He, and then went to teach at Colorado College ever since. He's been on the block plan uh, for 30 years, I guess. Uh, so um, he's a very experienced uh, teacher of uh, what we would call here intensive course. He does that for a living. Uh, and while he's somewhere in here, and I went to, uh, to, to visit with him at Colorado, and uh, we discovered something very peculiar about the place. Everybody talks about the block plan. They have official Colorado College watches that have blocks in them. They have t-shirts that have blocks in them. And when you ask somebody for the time of the day, they tell you what time of the block it is. They don't tell you <laughs> the actual time. So you will hear him talk about blocks at, at some point in time, or many times during his conversation, because they can shake the term, okay? But uh, we are not planning to implement blocks here, and we are only planning to, uh, to get his, uh, his opinions and ideas and see how we can make this work. Um, he's right now the associate dean for uh, uh, associate dean of the faculty. He's got many responsibilities. Uh, uh, Colorado College is a very flat structure. So, uh, but he oversees general education. He oversees uh, study abroad. He oversees all kinds of things and chairs many committees. He can tell you a little bit more about that. Uh, escaping all of them, we're not talking about it. <laughs> Thank you right. for bringing me here. Well, he's also in charge of the first year experience, and he has taught uh, interesting courses uh, in uh, eco, uh, feminism, uh, et, uh, ethnogeology, earth systems, and what have you. So uh, he has also taught uh, multidisciplinary uh, short courses or block courses, if you will. So. Uh, I'm going to leave you with, uh, with Jeff. He's a, he's a great guy. He's open to questions. He wanted to run this like a class. In fact, he didn't want these overheads. We actually had to tell him that RITs, RIT people like overheads. So <laughs> he said so. So anyway. Okay. If any of you have met a geologist before, you know we don't wear these. So <laughs> not my duty. Uh, I really appreciate the invitation to come and talk with you because I haven't had a chance in those 33 years of Colorado College to put together how the blocks work. And it's been fun this last month trying to come up with a reasonable talk. And I actually, I'm going to do this. It's the worst possible pedagogy. If you walk out of here with one lesson, it's do not lecture in the intercession from day one to day 15. <laughs> no, really. uh, but I'm going to do that for the, for the next 15 minutes as quickly as I possibly can and see what questions you may have. Uh, one of the beauties of working in the block plan, of course, is that I don't know if I'm an excellent speaker, but I do know I can talk for three hours really quickly. Uh, so we'll see how that works out. The key message today is one of pedagogical innovation. You have the opportunity to create a class distinct from any you've taught in semesters or quarters to reconceive your goals, that's the key word, based on the special focus the students will have on your class alone, and consider what techniques will allow you to create a student learning experience they won't forget. Here's the heart of the message. It is really important to start from scratch, reconceive your class, rather than try to move your semester notes into quarter, or quarter notes into three weeks. If you get nothing else, there's the, there it is. We'll start out briefly by reviewing the history, motivations, aspirations, the people like the dean at Colorado College had for creating this kind of an intensive course that we use. And you can judge if your rationales were similar. And then the second part of the talk, I would like to describe some of the structural aspects. Let's get into there. Um, that we've used that seem to work well in intensive courses that should lead you to think about teaching pedagogies you currently use that can be easily adapted. So really quick overview, CC didn't invent the, the blocks or intensive courses. Uh, but in the words of a person I'm going to quote a great deal this morning, 
our former Dean Glenn Brooks, who was a young political science professor in the late 1960s and became the architect of the block plan. Quote, we chose in 1970 not to change the curriculum directly, but rather to alter the structure within which teaching and learning occur and to let faculty decide, according to their own lights, what curricular changes would make sense within this new structure. Now, we know that intercession type formats were used in World War II for language training. Hiram College tried a block-like system in the late 40s, early 50s. Apparently, and I had this only secondhand, it fell apart because faculty had issues over contact hours that didn't appear to be equitable to them. The 1960s, great time of protests, questioning, rethinking old norms. Intriguingly, as riots were tearing other universities apart, Colorado College faculty and students came together around the question of how to give more attention to the students in a liberal arts setting. Today, other schools using the system include Cornell College, University of Montana Western, Tusculum College, Quest University in Canada, numerous schools with J terms, M terms, many business schools, and oddly enough, it's becoming more present in our high schools these days. Our plan is a little bit different from what you're conceiving uh, in detail. Our calendar is divided into eight three and a half week modules or blocks during each of which a student takes and a faculty member teaches one course. We now teach six as our required load. Blocks run, and this is where I will get confused with you and your block line because I understand you're starting at an odd day in the middle of a week for this first intercession. Uh, ours start always at 9 a.m. on a Monday and they end always at noon on a Wednesday. Uh, in between that, there's four and a half days of block break where the students are free to do as they please. Uh, that's also an important concept in here. And then we have a half block of nine days because the 18-day block was not sufficient. The nine days takes place in the second semester early in January, much like your intercession, and I do want to come back to that because it tells you something you will be able to do with your intercession courses. There are variations on this theme. Uh, some departments have different needs, so we developed extended format courses for fractional credit that would help students if their program needed more duration. Uh, these might include dance technique, language courses, uh, senior theses, seminars for seniors, joint faculty student research, projects like that. But to return to Glenn Brooks' words, faculty sought a curriculum that was not rigid or tightly defined, but built on discovery, experimentation, choice, and individual coherence. Key factors in the arguments were the eliminations of cross pressures or time stealing. For instance, heaven forbid, a student spending an evening in a chemistry lab rather than reading their English novel carefully. Better time management, allowing individual classes to establish their own needs and organize a day as best suited each class. And for students to learn to manage their time for study, labs, and leisure activities responsibly. Classes meeting in the best possible setting even if that involved extended field trips or travel, and the improved social personal connections among students engaged in these small classes. For Dean Brooks, the heart of the block plan is the intense block course which provides latitude to teachers and students to explore together the most effective ways to learn the subject at hand. No bells abbreviate a class meeting. Classes tend to meet formally at least five days a week for about two and a half to three hours a day but the time and format very widely, even within a course. His key message, I believe, was that one soon discovers that lecturing three hours a day, all block, violates the spirit of the block plan. But mixtures of informal lecture and discussion groups, labs, films, debates, tutorials, and a rich menu of fieldwork away from campus abound. The faculty member acquires an exciting opportunity and obligation to find the best way to accomplish the task. Perhaps the most valuable aspect of the block plan is the challenge it repeatedly presents to decide just what a course should be. Dean Brooks continues with aspects of the early system. Once adopted, so this may sound familiar, a thorough re-examination of teaching styles and classroom procedures was required. Fundamental changes were made by the faculty in its use of time in classes, in preparation for classes, in student advising and in scholarly endeavors. The plan fostered changes in classroom pedagogies, flexibility in curricular thinking and interdisciplinary engagement. 
classes were limited to 25 students and most were smaller. Students were actively involved in teaching, learning, and research. Discussion classes became the norm, ranging from free and open student-initiated classes to more structured, guided seminars. Preparation and planning for class were recognized and emphasized as the key to the full use of the block. Couldn't emphasize that one more. Faculty reported that teaching and the close work with students was more taxing than the semester system, but the advantages to teaching a single course rather than juggling three per semester were significant. Students lauded the approach, although obviously they were somewhat self-selected. The overall effect of no conflicts with other classes, more conferences between students and faculty, and a less hurried and structured day fits well with the ideas that reflection and contemplation are the ultimate activities of a liberal education. It permits faculty to work with students in more varied ways, unlimited by the 50-minute period, unencumbered by too large classes, and assured of the possibility of each student's full attention. In Dean Brooks' words, those early days were festive, creative, and indeed a little scary. We had a very clear idea of what we wanted to accomplish, but we were not at all sure how best to proceed. Does that sound familiar? We wanted to do a better job of traditional liberal education by gaining control over the time and place of education, by concentrating our energies more effectively, and by establishing a more intimate and close relationship between students and professors. But we simply had to use our good judgment and a lot of guesswork about how to teach and learn under the new plan. One note, CC avoided the problem Hiram College had by adopting an approach that one class receives one credit, regardless of lab, field trips, study abroad, with weekend classes, etc. It is a faculty choice to hold lab or put in the extra hours for field work. Interestingly, <coughs> Harry's survey that our faculty took showed that the total work time across all the divisions, including class prep and grading, came out exactly equal. One early example of change in this new system comes from a geology class. Professor Lewis took his students out into the field on day one and never went back to the classroom. The first day, the students were told to look at the rocks in the field and see if they could identify different minerals, which they called M1 and M2, different rocks that they were sitting in called R1 and R2. The next day, they go to a new outcrop. Is it the same as R1 or is this different? Do we need an R3? And he kept this going for the entire block till by the end of the block they had created their own geological structure exactly the way the first geologist had had to do the work. So it was an awesome learning experience. There was one <coughs> young lady in the class, Marcia McNutt, some of you may have heard that name. She was the first woman director of the U.S. Geological Survey a few years ago and was just appointed the chief editor of Science and its family of journals. Uh, she was in that class. She had 1,600 SATs a 4-0 GPA in high school in the Boston area, had her pick of schools, probably including RIT, who would have loved to have her come, and asked on public television when she was interviewed as one of the key women scientists in the country, why she went to Colorado College. We're all sitting there with bated breath. Block plan, innovative teaching. Her answer was, because of the block breaks when she could go skiing. <laughs> In those early days, adapting the block plan was a learning experience for many aspects. Courses that needed the repetition or time, such as the languages and science experiments, developed these extended formats meeting once a week for an hour or so. And we all agreed that we would end courses by 3 p.m. in the afternoon so that students could take these extended courses or participate in athletics or other leisure programs. Field trip budgets. Uh, we don't have the provost here. This is what you need to let them know you need. We have a fleet of two Greyhound buses with drivers, two 28-passenger vehicles, a dozen 12-passenger vans, several seven-passenger SUVs, our own mechanic shop with its engineers. It turns out to be much cheaper to run that than to rent the vehicles all the time. I don't know what it'll cost you here at RIT, depending on how often you use such vehicles, but please do investigate that year to year and see which way works better. It's an ongoing task. This must be the part that fascinates you to think about reorganizing classes like Calc 1 to 3. This afternoon in the workshop, I'll be sharing the syllabi we use for Calc 1 and Calc 2 so you can get a feel for what those look like in a short system. <clears throat> but even geology classes, the question is always, what do you do first? So should I go and talk about how rocks fold and break first? 
and then take students out into the field where they can see examples, or should I go first into the field and have them suddenly discover that the pattern of the rocks was broken and this is a fault, and then have this stellar summation lecture of what was going on ready for them? Or if you're in art class, do you show the Rembrandt painting first and say, analyze it, and walk away for an hour? Or do you start out by telling them how to analyze Rembrandt and then show the painting and have a much more focused discussion? The answer from Colorado College is, it depends. It's a chicken and the egg thing, we don't know. <clears throat> Important places that do matter. Library or IT help desks. <clears throat> Excuse me, I, I should have mentioned that I have horrible allergies and even with a few pills, it's way better here than it is sleeping with the three cats I left at home, but <laughs> it's still there. Uh, the patterns of usage are very different. We had a firm that was helping us to conceive a new library and they did a study and discovered that our students use the library starting at the beginning of the block on day one and they peak at the end of each block and repeat this four times in a semester. They compared that with semester usage which started out down here, had a little peak near midterms and then skyrocketed at the end. And the student usage and the need for staffing in the library was much higher than in a semester system. Same thing is true of the help desk. Day one of the class, students need to be in making sure their programs are loaded right, they've got the right technology, it's all set up because they can't wait and do it on day two or day three. So your folks in IT need to be ready to roll with this. Oh, basically, students expect immediate response since waiting overnight for help is not an option. That would be the key message. Our International Programs Office is a wonderful center for communication with partners abroad, with parents, tracking students and faculty abroad, keeping up with visa requirements, establishing good policies for faculty, your responsibilities while abroad, student health forms, behavior issues. We'll talk a lot more about that on Friday morning. Uh, our center really does provide significant preparation and support, but it won't serve as a travel agency. So I don't know what you all can expect here, but we'll see. The student success centers, we have writing, reading, and quantitative centers, also have the same different pattern, if that makes sense. It's not an oxymoron. Support is needed the first afternoon of the first day. Students will be there, and they'll be there every night for the rest of the block. Sundays are especially heavy, so making sure you've got staffing to help will be good. Disability services, same support that you would provide for qualifying students in the semester applies to your intercession. Whether it's more time to take exams, using smart pens in classes, converting text to audio format. The key here, looking at your schedule, is those texts need to be in the hands of the disability services who convert them a month ahead, maybe by Thanksgiving. Because if you hand them to somebody on day one and say, please convert this, and it's ready a week later, it's too late. Uh, considering alternative projects if you plan a field trip. So if you were a geologist taking a mountain hike, what is the student who's in the wheelchair going to be able to do? Oh, facilities and labs, if you're using any of these. If you had a power outage or a plumbing issue in the middle of a lab, maybe in a semester you've got time to look around and get it fixed a bit. You don't have the time on this. Um, all of our major instruments have service contracts to provide for same day service, next day at the worst, and rapid response. We can replace two of them on the spot out of an emergency fund, but it's really important for faculty to know how to jury rig to keep the labs running. Bottom line on all of this is that faculty need to know and have good working relationships with all the staff who support your work, including the specific librarians, IT troubleshooters, and facilities people who can keep your labs running. Plan ahead and give people time to prepare for the faster pace. <clears throat> I want to turn then in the second part of this talk to some of the aspects of teaching that don't seem to work in this plan. Structural aspects, just by having an intercession course, some things will change. And I've divided these into, excuse me, I think I'm going to get a little water for a moment. Oh, I've been told you all don't have plastic bottles to make sure you understand. I've carried this bottle for about three weeks. This is hotel water. It was <coughs> going to go back empty through airplane security and be filled up inside. <coughs> I do like the attitude. <laughs> it works well. Starting with some of the positive aspects. The classroom belongs to one course all day. I assume something similar is going to operate here. 
But that means that activities can continue in the afternoon and the evening. You can leave materials in the classroom. You aren't going to need to erase your board for the next person coming in. In fact, if you're lucky, the custodians won't erase your board so that information is there in the evening for students. We have to write save next to key pieces on our boards. Uh, students will come back to the classroom often as the best place to study. So whether it's a small discussion group or students just looking for a quieter place to study than their rooms, knowing the classroom is available. The block promotes close relationships between faculty and students in and out of the classroom. There's an expectation that faculty will pay attention to individual student learning needs, even if you're not trying to teach five different ways at the same time. But through interactive instruction and class activities, students will work together and build more cohesion than is found in a traditional class. It's common for us to have a class over for either a class breakfast or dinner near the end of the intersession, if you will. Watch this one. Students know that you have no other classes to prepare, no other students to teach, and they will ignore your scholarship, service, and family life. So they believe you are available 24 to 7, texting at 3 a.m. to solve their problems. Let them know your boundaries. I used to tell students when my daughter was about eight and had to go to school the next morning that anybody who woke my daughter up at night failed the course. And the next question was always, what time does she go to bed? <laughs> the intensive teaching and immersion programs may also influence you to incorporate more interaction, discussion, and other constructive teaching methods and provide for more continuity of discussion inside and outside the classroom. You might suggest topics to students to create such continuity and either let the students self-organize or create little groups to talk over dinner or coffee. Flexible scheduling. You can change the type of instruction you're using on the fly in response to student difficulties. Uh, I'm gonna use one example of extreme. This also comes from geology. It did not involve me, thank heavens. But the students noted on a particular Thursday that there were free ski lift tickets at Copper Mountain in Colorado. And they came to the professor and said, could we cancel class today if we were to meet on Saturday? In the block plan, you can do that. They then asked the professor to drive a van that was at geology expense <laughs> to go skiing, which he did. The multi-day field trips of various lengths. Every department on our campus has a field trip budget that uses day trips, community-based learning ideas, lectures up at CU Boulder, or going to museums in Denver, or interacting with local industry. Off-campus courses, extensive field trips are also encouraged because students can leave the campus without disrupting concurrent responsibilities. Whether it's work or athletics, though, you might want to pay attention to the things that do interfere, even if they're just in the one class. Advice would be to be sure that you have clear policies on everything imaginable, from whether personal vehicles on college trips are covered by college insurance. They're not at CC, uh, so you can get badly sued if there's an accident. Uh, will you leave as a group from a point on campus, or will you just meet at a destination? What alcohol and drug policies if you're out overnight? Are you going to make a trip completely dry regardless of individuals' ages, or let local laws apply? Uh, who do you call for and what type of emergency? What are your faculty responsibilities? You want to know these things before you delve into the field trips. The block type system allows you to attract distinguished professionals and experts in a field who could spend time with your class that they could not have spent with a semester. A short course might accommodate them for the three weeks and they might immensely enrich the curriculum. A variation you all might think about this on the East Coast is coming up with someone you think is interesting, whether it's a religious leader, business CEO, or a diplomat from the UN who could come and be with your class for a whole day or several days. One thing parents notice when they visit the campus is that there are no clocks in our classrooms. No bells ringing to signal the end of the day. No time stealing from other classes. Make use of these during an intercession. It also seems to promote team teaching and interdisciplinary teaching. Interdisciplinary courses are just easier to create when you don't have to worry about working out each other's semester system. Although I would caution you, our faculty are very gung-ho about this, and both faculty, knowing they have all day, tend to teach their entire classes. It's not team teaching. It's like two classes stuffed at once into six hours a day. Don't do that. There's no cramming for a week of exams on your students' part. Just one exam at a time. Much simpler for them. And one point, 
that Fernando was asking about that I would love to make is that combining our half block, the nine-day session, with a class in block five right after that, or with a semester class extended, has worked extremely well for us. So blending your intercession course with a semester course should be just a fabulous thing to consider. So for instance, our biology classes used a half block to teach field ecology principles, and then they traveled to either Belize or Patagonia in block five, where apparently this is the only place where plants exist on the planet. Chemistry combined a semester-long extended course on the science of AIDS with a service learning trip to Tanzania during the half block. Religion had a half block course on religious experiences followed with a semester-long practicum. So combining these two might create some opportunities that you would not otherwise be able to share with your students. You may have noticed I'm enthusiastic about these short intensive courses. There are some problems. Some of the negative aspects, and the one that I could not emphasize enough, is it's exhausting. When you start looking at your contact hours, our minimum really is three hours daily for the 18 days with scattered afternoon work sessions going on, so about 60 hours for what we call four semester hours credit. But if you're teaching a lab course from nine to three or nine to five, most, if not all days a week, that's 108 contact hours for that one class, which translates to 30 faculty contact hours a week. Uh, if you're running a field class, eight to five all day, plus on duty 24 to seven, it gets even higher. So watching the exhaustion for your students and for yourself, monitor and respond with daily changes is essential. Remember, you can't procrastinate your grading, you can't come to class unprepared. If a class goes bad, you've got no time to recover. So you need to pay close attention to your student learning abilities and the particulars of that class. What are you going to do in case of illness or absence? Typically, we allow two days of illness in an 18-day block, after which we'll need a good excuse. But could you help a student make up missing work virtually now while they're sitting in their bed, hacking the flu or bird flu or whatever they might have had? Uh, are there alternative assignments you might be able to give them if they're really ill? Or worst of all, how about athletes who are leaving campus Friday morning for a game I've heard there's another Tiger hockey team out here somewhere that's pretty decent. Uh, some faculty worry that they need even more time for the reflection and analysis of what they're studying, which is where the afternoon sessions often come in. And the big issue, for which we don't have an answer, depth versus breadth, and the role of experiential aspects in a course. It really is difficult to cover the same material that you would have in a semester or even a quarter if you replace some of your old lecture moments with these experiential moments, trips, whatever you are doing. So students might not be asked to read as much material as in other systems. How do you feel about the trade-off? And that's your personal decision. Courses at CC in history, for instance, have titles like Europe from 1789 to 1848. I still haven't figured out 1848. I was too much Americanized. I know what it is in geology, but Europe. Or from 1848 to 1914. Uh, define the manageable chunk for what you want to cover within your intercession course. If there are administrators in here, you'll discover that the shorter intercession courses are going to have some cost increases in everything from registration to record keeping, course scheduling, student advising. Our faculty discovered there was a problem during the block. There's no time for inform informal interchange with your colleagues. You're just too busy, so you won't see anybody else to chat with. And probably the most important out of this list, do not plan on reading a journal article, except on the toilet, much less composing a grant proposal or an article while you're teaching an intercession course. It just isn't going to work, especially the first time around. I think the key at RIT is that you're going to avoid many of the longer term negatives involved here because you just have the one intercession course rather than the back to back to back approach that we would have. But do think carefully about how much grading you're going to plan to do over the weekend between intercession and the start of the semester and when you're going to get your semester courses ready. So how might you take advantage of these positive negative structures and actually build good teaching practices into your class? Many of the practices that CC developed back in 1970 have become good teaching practices nationwide now. So the ideas of student-centered learning, hands-on, activity-based learning, flipping the classroom, blended learning exercises are all ones that we've fiddled with over the last 
40 odd years. And my message would be that good teaching is good teaching in any system, regardless of the curricular structure. So just stick with that. Among some of the good practices that we know work well in our block, one, you definitely prepare the class well ahead because you're still going to need time to reread a text, look at your notes daily while you're grading papers. If you're not prepared, then at most four hours of sleep a night before teaching your next class, five days in a row gets pretty intense. Would you have help if you want to set up a lab exercise, or are you going to have to do that during breakfast or lunch? Uh, when are you going to put materials on the computer for students to look at? So we have a Moodle equivalent we call Prowl. Are you going to have those materials up by Thanksgiving, which would be really planning ahead, or over Christmas break, which would be normal? Putting them up the first day of class or finding time to put them up after that is going to be very difficult. Uh, keep up with your work daily and come prepared. From Dean Brooks one more time, one good approach is to give students a lot of reading and daily classes based on the reading in the first week with at least one short paper during that week so that you can take the measure of their spoken and written analysis. It is then much easier to know what students are getting out of a course. When one looks out on 50 faces for 50 minutes in a semester course, not very much comes back from the students. Not so in the block plan or intercession. A professor knows through his or her pores what the class is doing. And if one is sensitive, adjustments adjust themselves accordingly. In the second week, one might change the pace a bit with a free reading or writing day and some individual conferences as well as several full class sessions. In the last week or week and a half in our case, you might allow at least some time for preparation of a longer final paper or other concluding assignments, written exam, oral exam, oral presentations, the manner of evaluation is up to you. We do strongly suggest reduced lecturing. The three hour lecture harkens back to the days of the sage on the stage. 15 days at three hours per day is overwhelming. But lectures can be effective in the right circumstances. So we use mini lectures, 15 to 20 minutes at a time to initiate discussion, summarize discussion halfway through and at the end of the course or morning. To set up a problem for students to work on, have them work on it for a little bit and then to offer a lecture to help with the points that they were missing during that problem working moment. Interactive lectures or presentations of material work very well, filled with questions for the students to see what they understand, looking at the web for a new piece of information, uh, unlike what I'm doing this morning, really bad pedagogy in the block. Faculty are less likely to come to class with detailed lecture notes than to carry an index card with three critical concepts they want to make sure that they cover. And even your lecture class can be filled with student presentations. If I'm teaching about earthquakes, I might do an overview of earthquakes and have the students come up and do three minute presentations on particular earthquakes where they describe what's happened by having gone to the web the night before. Discussion also becomes deadly if you have a standard approach of students reading say 100 pages a night and then talking about it the next day for 15 days in a row. So student led discussions tend to be more impactful. They increase accountability. They get everyone involved because students love to start their discussions by asking all of their peers right around the circle to summarize each section of the reading. And everybody coming knows they're going to be asked to do some section, but they don't know which one it's going to be. It's a little more free ranging, but you can guide it. It does help if, as a faculty member in a system like that, you ask the students who are going to lead the next day's discussion to meet with you the afternoon ahead and go over the work with them to kind of guide them to what the key concepts ought to be. Remember that if students keep turning to you as the faculty member to see if they said the right stuff, you're back to sage on the stage. Don't do that. Try to get them talking to each other. Breakout groups work very well. You can have a breakout group run for an hour. Have a discussion for an hour and break out and put them in pairs or small groups. Remember that long class period. The discussions tend to go much deeper. You have time for close reading, checking information up, taking the discussions further into a text than you can do in a 50 minute period. You may expect, you will expect, the students to do extensive reading work at night and come to class having done their work. Homework, reading, lab reports need to be done that same day. And in fact, if your students are used to semester timing where they've got a day's break, you're going to need to remind them they have to go do it that day. Classrooms thus tend to be pre-flipped in the new sense of the word. We didn't know to use that word. But 
they tend to be flipped already, more active, more student-centered. And peer pressure is wonderful. If you have a group of 12 students and two of them didn't come prepared, the other 10 are gonna let them know that they didn't hold up their end of the three hours of discussion with that professor, and they better do the work the next night. If students are unprepared at class, you have another option. Let them know what it was you expected them to have done, and then send them home for the morning to do it and hold your class in the afternoon. Number of techniques that have worked well for us. E-journaling, you know the techniques, listen to the pacing. You send the students home with a reading and by 9 p.m. that night they all have to have written a one-page essay that others are going to read and get it loaded up into whatever chat room prowl system you're using. By 9 a.m. they have to have read two of the other entries and added paragraph comments on those entries. And if you're fortunate, and this has happened once to me, you walk into the classroom and the students are calling each other names and arguing with each other so intensely they don't even know that you came in and the conversation has already started. Jigsaw projects are my, one of my favorites. Uh, you may know the technique, but again, the timing. So I, I use the Los Angeles earthquake. I give them the thesis. There will be a magnitude eight earthquake in Los Angeles in your lifetime that will cause over $1 trillion worth of damage. Now what? Divide them up into five groups. One is doing the probability of that earthquake. One is doing historic earthquakes. One might be doing economics of that system, politics. I tell students that you need to vote for the person you don't want in power because when the earthquake hits, that party is toast because uh, we won't be able to fix it. Uh, somebody else might do personal psychological issues. And then the next morning, you come in with the groups, right, and you have them all count off. So one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. You put all of the ones together in a new group and have them write the paper, the three-page white paper that goes to the president, advising the president on what needs to be done at this time. Accountability is huge because each of the new groups has only one expert from that topic, and you have to know the topic. And the interaction. Students have just met 10 of their classmates, which in our classes is half of the class. So I love that kind of an exercise. It just works fast. Workshop models, particularly in writing classes, are incredibly effective, whether you pair students up or have one student present their work to the group for feedback. Blended learning techniques looking wonderful to us. Uh, whether it's video clips that you have to help students review fundamental principles in the middle of the night, or whether you're downloading live data on an environmental site with a class that's sitting in Brazil and comparing what's going on in the tropics with your class in the mountains, have fun. Everywhere, whatever you do, it's strengthen the experiential, hands-on, based, activities-based moments. And just think about the time you have each day to do that. Concept that is very important as you're going along during the days. Assessment of student learning. Yeah. I've slowly learned that what CC has meant by that and what others mean by that are somewhat different, but the things that we do during a day that matter. Day one, learn your student names. One, it lets them know you care, and two, it lets them know they're not gonna be able to hide. So I'll typically take a class into the field on the first day, and as they're working on the outcrop, I'm going around making sure I've got all three names, all three names as they're in little groups. And when we come back as a group, I just go around and name them all, and the point is made. Uh, or you can put little name tags in front of you. Over the course of a week, get their names down pat that way. Pay close attention to the students in their state of exhaustion. There are limits to what they can absorb, regardless of your efforts to vary your pedagogy. So don't be afraid to have a day without formal class when the students might have a project, library research, a poem to write, or hear some wonderful engineering feat to pull off. You aren't held in check by bells, so you can take a few minutes to settle in and check on where the students are before class each day. Take your time at the start of class. You might use short quizzes. Five question, three question quiz on the previous night's reading, a question on the previous day's work, uh, another form of e-journals that works here is to ask for a daily entry from the students. You don't count grammar, bullets are great, fragments are great, and just ask them what the three key ideas from the reading were. You read those in your office before you go down to class, and you've got a pretty good sense of where your students are starting from and what you need to do. Um, Student-led reviews. Have a pair of students who will come in and for 10 minutes at the start of class tell you what they thought was important from the previous day get through any or all of these techniques and take 10 to 30 minutes to review what they should have gotten from the day before. 
You can't do that in a 50-minute period. Prompt grading is essential. The students need your feedback before they start working on the next assignment. So structure any exams or papers to allow for this. Consider posting the results of your labs and homework as assignments are turned in. They aren't going to turn in late assignments. They have the next one due the next day. So you don't have to worry about whether you posted the answers for the late person. One of our faculty members uses I annotate PDF and Dropbox to mark student papers with little audio clips attached so that they're getting feedback about three times as fast as people like me who still write comments on a paper and hand them back. So think about some of the technology ways that might be. What is the name of this? I annotate, capital A, small i, PDF. Did you know about the system? So talk with Ann afterwards. I don't know this one. Some of the faculty use personal response systems as little eye clickers or electronic buzzers to get immediate feedback on whether students are with them, what's the next step in the lecture going to be. Or for accountability on discussion breakouts, use the old system of randomly choosing one person out of the group who's going to speak for the group. A one to three page paper that you assign on the first day of class and is due on the third day is a fantastic way to really let the students know what your expectations and standards are if you can grade it on that third night and return it on the fourth day. Halfway course evaluation check. I like a red light, yellow light, green light system. I'll have a list of approaches that I've been trying, lectures, discussions, reading assignments, journals, problem sets, and ask students to put red, yellow, or green next to it. Meaning stop doing this, there's problems ahead, or we're going fine. And if you do that early in the second week, middle of the second week, you've still got a chance to adjust your course and keep people on track. If you decide to require a final paper, you need to review every step of the process early and often. You want a topic and a bibliography by the end of the first week. Uh, you'll want to check on the students' references that they have on hand, not that are still in the interlibrary loan space somewhere, by the end of the second week. And you probably want to leave the second weekend open for them to work on that paper and complete a draft, which if you had time and were really gung-ho, you could look at a few days before the end of the class and give them quick comments. Key moments when you're planning a class, and we'll do some of this this afternoon in the, in the second workshop. Put the experiential moments in there first. Always a mistake to do it the other way around. So start with what you're going to build your course around <clears throat> in terms of the students' activities. <coughs> Excuse me. And think about anything that needs to be flexible, like going out into the field in case you get a snowstorm. Are you going to have community-based learning projects? Are you going to have day trips to a city, a museum, a concert, a show? Will you have a week-long trip? And if so, are you camping or using a motel? And what's the cost to students? They'll want to know that way ahead. Our anthropology department will go for a week into the southwest to a Native American dance. They get three days notice of when the dance is going to occur, but they can get the vans and go. Uh, we had a class on Dante and Michelangelo that decided the best place to teach it would be Florence and Rome. So they went over to Italy and managed to wing I, this one I'm truly jealous of. One hour alone, just the class in the Sistine Chapel. Yeah, should have been an English teacher. Uh, we have an economics of innovation class that goes to Boston, of all places, for a week and just interacts with different businesses morning, afternoon, and evening. Block-long trips. Geology has gone to Japan, New Zealand, Scotland. We have archaeoastronomy in the southwest. I'm just trying to give you ideas to get you thinking here. Sociology has gone to Sierra Leone as well as Polynesia. English has been taught in Harlem and in Paris. There's a senior art trip every year to New York City. We teach drama in London. Uh, filmmaking is taught in Hollywood. You heard about biology going to Patagonia and Belize. Drawing is being taught in Spain as we speak. Summer classes, because you can do some of this in the summer as well, right? Language instruction is done in a language that speaks the language. Just go. A fun note on the field trips, if you wake up one morning and realize you really aren't prepared for class, get a van, take the students somewhere, anywhere they're going to love the class. Day one is crucial. Students make a choice about whether they're going to stay or leave your class on that first day. Do not read the syllabus, call, roll, and then leave. You need a real class on the first day, some activity that is typical of the class and helps students make up their minds. 
In a geology class, we take them out into the field and have them looking at rocks and minerals, putting a story together, plate tectonics and mountain building. And if they don't enjoy that, they know they're in the wrong class. Uh, an ecofeminism class that Fernando mentioned that I teach, I have a wonderful little article. It's all of six or seven pages long, very controversial. I hand it to them on the first morning, tell them to go read it over lunch and come back after lunch and we're gonna take an hour and talk about it. And they know what the topic of the course is going to be like. That first week, you really need a lot of representative readings, set the tone and expectations high. Go to the last week. What are you going to do on your next to last day, which I think is a Wednesday for the intercession this time around? Are you going to review your course for a final test? Are you going to add in new material that the students won't have an opportunity to really practice with? Or are you going to keep that next to last day for the best summary lecture you could imagine pulling the whole class together? From Dean Brooks again, the central educational principle of the block plan is that an active participant, the student is an active participant instead of a passive spectator. To this end, faculty have virtually complete control of the time, place, and format of the course. We trust you to make pedagogical judgments about what needs to be done on a given day or week to enhance active student learning. Therefore, we have no class schedule. It will be up to you to decide what time the class meets, how long and how often it meets, and in some cases, where it meets. We had a philosophy professor who met day one in his assigned classroom and then started walking around class. And if you weren't with him at the end of the day, you wouldn't know where the next day's class was starting, much less where it was going to end up. It has become increasingly important now to post your syllabus online or somewhere early so that work study students and athletes, those in extended courses, can make plans ahead. Course formats will vary greatly under the block plan, to continue quoting Dean Brooks. A course in modern fiction differs significantly from organic chemistry. A professor has the opportunity to decide on the appropriate mix among lectures, reading assignments, small group discussions, individual conferences or tutorials, examinations, papers, and student presentations. This is not to suggest all of these should be used in a single course, only that you are free to use anything in the academic repertoire that seems suitable. Depending upon your own style and the background of the students, you may find that some lectures, or at least many lectures, are helpful, but since you can expect students to be prepared for class and to be present, you will find that structured discussions based on the readings are usually productive. The key to the block plan is varying the rhythm. What you do with your daily classes, levels of assignments, building in the research day in the library, how many pages are you going to read daily? Is it better to have them read 50 pages, which they might actually read twice, and then put an intelligent entry into an e-journal? Or get through 250 pages, which you know they're skimming and the smart ones are reading the end so that they'll sound like they finished the whole thing even though they never read the beginning. Don't do daily discussion or lecture the same. Whatever you do, there's going to be burnout at the end of your second week. Students are going to be burned out as they go into that second weekend and come back to class that last Monday. So be prepared for that. Think about how you time your exams and papers uh, on this. If you give a test on Friday, you have the weekend to grade. If you give a test on Monday, the students have the weekend to study. If you do finals, for heaven's sake, do not have a final paper and a final exam due on the last day of the intercession. You won't be ready for the semester to start if you're grading these. Space them out so that students might spend that second weekend working on a project and prepare for the last day during that third week. Our faculty often use oral exams or presentations instead of written finals because it reduces the grading time, one of our great secrets, at the end of the block, whether you do these in small groups or individually. The last few moments here this morning, I wanted to look a little bit about assessment of these kinds of intensive courses. How well do we know how do we know how well they work, if you will? Uh, the answer is that all the evidence is indirect. There have been no really good comparative studies, a lot of self-studies, uh, but they're very limited. Small sample sizes, loosely defined learning outcomes, uh, difficulty of assessing retention across different disciplines, and controlling for all the intervening variables you can imagine. We asked the Hanover Research Group down in DC a year ago to do a summary study for us of everything they could find that had been done for research on these kinds of classes. And between them and some of our own studies, the rest of this information is coming out of those reports. So a couple of the results we've noticed for students. 
The students report an increase in focus, stamina, and retention with a decrease in procrastination. Dean Brooks noted in one of his reviews that students come to class practically all of the time and are with few exceptions well prepared for class discussion. They have little alternative but to give first priority to your course. <coughs> Concentrating on just that one topic has another practical consideration for traditional age college <coughs> students. Research has shown that 18 to 20 year olds have not acquired the organizational ability to juggle five courses with their inconsistent requirements, overlapping and competing deadlines. Because studies have indicated the human brain is not equipped to do multiple things well at one time, like driving, talking on cell phone, taking one course at a time can help all sorts of students stay on track. Students report anecdotally that they are well prepared for the intensity of medical and law schools. They don't have the same issues that their peers seem to suffer from with the pacing of those schools. Students who study abroad are known to purchase their textbooks before the class starts, do every assignment immediately, and then look around and discover that their fellow students from semester systems haven't even bought the book until midterms. Block breaks are important. I notice you've built at least a three-day break into this first intersession. The students will need time to recover from that intercession course. We do a lot of student life trips, particularly service trips around the Southwest, and it's a great moment for your student life housing people if they have something planned. Uh, I would just watch for the first week of the semester. They're going to slack off, and if you start the semester slow, you're fine. You might not notice it, but if you're ready to start your semester at full speed, the students who are in intercession are going to be not quite there with you. From Glenn Brooks, his evaluation of the block plan indicates that our students do not show dramatic improvement in factual retention over students in conventional semesters, but do seem to develop certain skills more effectively. Our students do not procrastinate. They are very good at sustained concentration and managing their time. They are fast learners and develop a rather high degree of self-confidence. Small classes with limits increase the probability that students will speak more frequently and by the time a student is a senior at Colorado College, he or she has had multiple opportunities to try publicly spoken analysis. All of us have complaints about student writing, but students write at least as much under the block plan in a session as they did under a semester system, with more emphasis on short papers and quick turnaround time. That being the key. The Hanover Research Group noted the following that I've put up there. Cognitive research suggests taking multiple courses at one time may cause interference that hinders the brain's ability to store new knowledge in its long-term memory. Students may experience cognitive overloading when taking simultaneous courses or conflicting subjects, and demonstrable improvements that occur in the block plan include increasing focus and stamina, curbing dropouts, uh, that was an interesting side effect we had not expected, improving rapport and cohesion between students and teachers, and increasing flexibility in a student's course of study. That report led to the following key findings. Block plans with intensive courses were created because of time constraints posed by traditional semester-long classes. Intensive courses are a hotly debated subject within the higher education realm today, and there's conflicting literature regarding their pedagogical effectiveness. Accelerated learning programs that offer intensive courses are expected to continue growing, particularly for non-traditional students. It is estimated there are 250 institutions in the U.S. offering courses that fall under an accelerated learning model. Overall, many of the studies suggest that intensive courses have equivalent or superior learning outcomes compared to traditional studies, but there's no clear evidence to suggest that intensive courses sustain positive long-term outcomes. Due to conflicting research and methodological approaches, it is difficult to make generalizations comparing teaching practices, but some documented practices shown to have success include modifying your instructional approaches to maximize student learning experiences, establishing a comfortable classroom environment and positive learning experience by implementing a variety of teaching methods, utilizing alternative forms of assessment such as student performance, classroom discussions, and demonstrations. Wrapping this up, all of this suggests to me that the types of courses RIT is experimenting with this first year make really good sense. Think about interesting liberal art courses that focus on one topic. 
not Russian literature, but maybe Tolstoy. It's not the introduction to geology, but my favorite catastrophic geology, earthquakes, volcanoes, doom, gloom, you're all going to die. Uh, as well as courses that are designed to review and prepare students for the next class in a sequence. So your Calc 1 or foreign language review from the first semester to build the skills and confidence in students going into a second semester. The one thing I would suggest if you do that is do not try to reteach the entire first semester class, but use your good judgment as a faculty member to know where it is students typically have problems and focus in on those key concepts. If you have time in a small enough class, working individually with them on the pieces they don't understand is going to make the intercession a joy. If you have an idea for field work, off-campus study, or international travel, plan early and start with those concepts and build the class around them. <coughs> Overall, Colorado College faculty stay at the college because we love the block plan. Despite its rapid pace, demand for prompt grading, and exhaustion, the opportunity for innovative teaching, for instance, teaching in the field for a geologist, is just too good to pass up. Because RIT is going to be doing this as a single intercession course rather than back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back blocks, you should have all the joys of developing a new pedagogy without any of the faculty exhaustion. And in the end, you're going to be your own best teachers on this. So I do urge you to come back as a group after the intercession and talk about techniques that did and didn't work for you. I do wish you truly well in this endeavor, and thank you for your attention this morning. Questions? You mentioned uh, students getting sick, but how do you handle faculty who get sick? We may not do that. Yeah. <laughs> we have a law to color it up. And the amazing part is the faculty get, and after a year or two of teaching it, it just works that way. Students need their first year to understand it. You get sick during block break. You do everything you possibly can to keep going for the three weeks. And that, that three days that you'll have between intercession and semester, there's going to be a lot of students just sleeping in there. Um, I've thought a lot, actually, about that question because it's very difficult. And a lot of it comes down because we're in it as a group. So if I were teaching Calc 1, which you don't want me to do, by the way, I haven't done Calc 1 for very many years. Uh, and I actually fell ill and knew that I wasn't going to be coming to class for two days, had the flu. You know, cold, you just dose up and keep coming. Uh, I'm calling the department and saying, is there somebody there? We're doing integration today. Everybody knows it. Who could come in and step in and do this? Uh, if I were in a class that was somewhat more singular, say a geology class, I might call one of my fellow colleagues in the department and say, could you do that fabulous lecture I know you do on dinosaurs? It doesn't have anything to do with earthquakes and volcanoes, but wait, there were some volcanoes that might have wiped the dinosaurs out. We know something, but it could make something up and give them a talk. So Aren't they appealing. Their it, if, remember the eight blocks, six out of eight? Any given block, there's someone in a department of four or five who's not teaching. And that's the person to count. Uh, although you, there is one block a year in geology, for instance, every October, at the end of October, which is the national meeting, that none of us are teaching. The dean looks at the schedule and says, why aren't there any geology classes? Well, we're all at the meetings, and it's three or four days, and we can't juggle that. Uh, we let any visitors we have <laughs> come in and teach on those blocks. Is it, does that, it's not a great answer but it's a you struggle through answer. Um, yeah, we, we talked with the faculty, um, we had dinner with them, and we met with a whole bunch of them, and they all basically said, you can't get sick. We don't get sick. And they were, they were exhausted, and they, were, they get tired, and they did say that it's hard to find someone because you've got your other faculty teaching in the, one course in the same block. But they did mention, too, that they, some of them would design some independent activities that if something did happen, they could have a research day kind of in their back pocket or something that would substitute for that. But they That's said, we can't get sick. And after the first year, you, you, get really on, you get on the cycle. And I said, people had children, people had, you know. And they said for a lot of the, the um, their dual career academics um, around, and they said they actually try to juggle their schedule so that they're not in the same block and things like, you know, not a bunch of block. But, so they, they try to help a lot with the intercession. But. Right. But lining up that, that library day or the reading day, you might just have to move it. Yeah, right. So they had to 
they have a little, they have like, they talk about plan A, plan B, plan C, and plan D. They always add some, I mean, in case of anything, plans, right? um, they had multiple plans, but they don't get sick there. There was a question back there. So I understand there is a budget for each class for field trips. Uh, and uh, of course they But Fernando just disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so field trips and cares. Uh, of course, probably that that there, the student would have to come up with a, uh, some kind of funding uh, to cover their expense. How how does that the field trip and okay. sort of yes, yeah, so yeah, uh, study yeah, abroad come up? Well, I think it's a very important point, and I do want to. It's Friday morning. We're going to focus on field trips and international, and I want to talk about that at length. The most unfair practice left at Colorado College, and the new president has been told in no uncertain terms she's going to terminate this is charging students a program fee to go abroad. So if we take a field trip to our, we have a cabin in the mountains, we have a campus that's <coughs> over the way with townhouses and condos, no ski area. And a lot of us just go with the buses. If we do those, the departments have budgets that have been in place for 30 years, although they have been increased. So the question you're asking is the question that our faculty asked 40 years ago. How do we build the budget to do this? Gradually, carefully, you just have to keep putting some money in there. Um, those students just get on the bus and go. There's no cost. But when you want to go abroad, the students need the airfare, they need the extra room because they have a, they've already paid for room at home and now they're paying for room there. Mm -hmm. We get board rebates, so that's covered. Uh, but visas, all sorts of things come up. And we've known for years that basically the only students who go abroad with you are the wealthy, the ones who aren't on aid. So we have a uh, woman who teaches uh, African-American negritude movement in Paris, which is the English class that goes to Paris. And she really wants a diverse group of students. And for years, all she has gotten are the very wealthy who go to Paris and spend their afternoons and evenings in the shops. Drove her up a wall. And we finally came up with some extra money to help pay these student program fees um, so that anybody could go in the first class that was like that was highly diverse. She called it the best class she'd ever taught. Students were in awe of what they learned in that process. So part of the new capital campaign is going to be creating an endowed fund that will provide aid for every student to cover their program. That would be my recommendations. You want to have that as your goal, that there should be no charge to a student going abroad with a class. And then you're going to get the students who want to be there. Uh, it's a long run. How do you fit your scholarship and service request during uh, your, uh, currently, you said that you don't. Uh, I don't think that's an option here. But, uh, oh, with, with the faculty during this? Okay. Yeah. No, seriously, you don't. When I'm in the middle of a teaching block, <laughs> yeah. you, know, and then you got to listen, it's six out of eight. Yeah. So the message to a new faculty, if I told that to a new faculty, you know, I, I mentor the new faculty, it'd be toast. Uh, the message needs to be that during the six blocks, you're teaching a block. You are teaching the block, and the students really own you. You truly, if you have time to read a journal article in that month, you're lucky. You're not going to do much writing. I know one, one of our superstar faculty is capable during the course of a three-hour morning, we often have 10 or 15-minute breaks in there, uh, he will go back to his office and edit an article during that 10 minutes and then get back into class. He's insane. <laughs> but if you have six blocks you are teaching, 18 days a block, how many days of the year are left? The opportunity for focused periods on scholarship, not just an hour stolen today and an hour here in a semester, are unbelievable. And the amount of work you can get done when you have a non-teaching block and you have actually 22 days ahead of you with no students and maybe one committee that you have to show up for, what can you get written? So you, I mentioned that the scholarly pedagogies change. There's the example. You have to set your time to respect the block because doing that grading, you know, if it's if it's a calculus class, I pray that you've thought about student graders for the daily homework. Because uh, if you have to do the homework every night yourself, it's going to be a very long intercession class. Uh, so getting help from students for the daily grinds of the work is important. Uh, and service, when faculty don't show up for a committee, and the administrator is going, where were you? We missed you. And they're like, grading a paper. What can you say? It's a great excuse. It really works. I'm going to use it a lot. When it's I'm going back to teaching next year. This is my eight years in the dean's office is enough. Uh, so sabbatical for the next year, and then 
back to teaching. So that matters to me. Uh, my question is about uh, student expectations. So you said that the faculty during this period is available for these intensive amounts of times. I can see our students looking at a course that meant like, well, we meet in class every morning for four hours, and then you said there's times where we're going to meet again in the afternoon. And for our courses specifically, there will be teams, people meeting in teams afterwards. And I can see our students doing their working part time, or they, they kind of view the class time as their commitment. So that's probably built into your culture already. But you know, uh, with think, difficulty, the athletes understand it. Some of our best students on campus are our athletes because they are so scheduled and so organized. They've got it broken down to 15 minute slots when they're at practice, when they're out, when they're doing this reading, when they're doing this project. It's lovely to watch. It's the work study students who haven't figured out how to organize but have to work that you're looking out for. So step one is if your syllabus with its afternoon expectations is online a month ahead, they will sign up or not sign up because of it. And if they do sign up and they have work, they're gonna have a month to talk with their employer about shifting schedules. So the important thing is don't surprise them. Don't come in if, if you know you have the work study <laughs> students. Then the flexibility, some of it disappears. You can't come in on a Wednesday and say, oh, today I wanna to have afternoon class. And they're all looking at you. We don't have time to work with our employer. That's what you can't do. So if, if it's online, they can read it ahead, make their plans ahead. You remind them on day one that you have these expectations in the next three weeks of their afternoon times. Uh, I would recommend sticking with our three o'clock rule. Plan on being done by three in a way that allows somebody who has work study or a sports practice to go. Uh, rough. The rule doesn't apply to field trips and international trips, by the way. Does that answer enough? Yes, sir, of it? thank you. Okay. Something else in the back here? Oh, okay. Sorry, one quick question. Um, I, you seem to imply, but didn't come right out and say, add drop is day one. Ah, I noticed yours and ours are a little different in the schedule, so I was trying not to conflate our two institutions too much this morning. Uh, ours is day two. So we start on a Monday at 9, and by Tuesday at 5, add drop period, the free add drop period is over. So after Tuesday at 5, if you walk in Wednesday morning to a class and say, I've got to have your class at their space, can I get in? It's up to the professor. The dean's office will never tell the professor they need to add that student, even if the course is needed to graduate. If the professor wants to take that student late and can make a case for how they're going to make two days they missed, two out of 15, do the math. Now, are they going to make it up or not? How, what can you do to help them make it up? Um, there are faculty who will add somebody that third morning. Nobody will add after that. We do allow students to drop up through the second week Tuesday without failure, no credit showing up on their record, but they can't add anything else. They've lost the money. We don't refund. The administration should be hearing this. No refunds after that Tuesday at 5. Oh. So it, it's, it's a schedule that's worked out, well known. Uh, my only concern, if I were a student here, would be that the students know it. So they probably know what your semesters are going to be. They're used to the quarters. They know they have a certain amount of time. But in that intercession, how many days before they have to decide drop by? We are thinking about it. Thinking about it. Yeah. Um, my, my advice then would be two days of work can typically be made up. Three days can't be. That's a fifth of your 20% of your class down the tubes. So you know, those are good practical questions. And if you've heard some of this, and it's some of what I'll repeat this afternoon and tomorrow particularly, policies are your best friend. Policies, we have a 25 student limit, but students are always coming in. I've heard such great things about your class. I've always wanted to take it. Well, yes, I was signed up for another class, but I couldn't get in there, so I'm coming to your class now. Uh, will you take a 26, a 27th, a 28th student? And it is incredible what those last three kids cost you in grading time. When you're focused on 25, you know where 25 is. You know, you pace yourself grading a paper. Those last three are killers. And it's unfair for the students who got in the class in the first place, right? Because you have 25 students who got in there by following our registration system. And they can expect 1 25th of your attention. You add three more, suddenly they're not getting it. So sticking to the policies and letting the policies protect you from yourself is really the way I like to think of that. It can be very important. Thank <clears throat> you.
maybe done with larger classes, up to 40, 50? There's, it's a debate within the faculty. So our psychology department is of the opinion that they're gonna lecture anyway, regardless of everything I just said up there. And therefore, having 50 students in a class is a much more effective and efficient way to get them through the psychology major than having 25. But the parents didn't pay for 50 in a class. They paid for 25 at our ridiculous tuition levels. And we get the calls from the parents pretty quick. In the, in the two courses like that, and neuropsychology is one of them, uh, that we've experimented with, the student response has been pretty positive because they're science majors, they're geeks, they're good at lecture notes. You know, the, the kids who come out of high school who are really good at taking lecture notes and scored really high on SATs, you know, your A students, they want that three hour lecture. They'll just take the notes down and they won't be there. They'll be zoned out just in la la land while their hands are taking notes and they'll say, we learned it. <laughs> you know, and we're sitting there trying to turn the system on its head. For the sciences, it's still a little tough. For the humanities, liberal arts courses, Students get it from the first block they take that they're going to have reading at night and they're going to come prepared to discuss and they better hold their part of the stick up. Oh, but how you break up, the chemists are almost <coughs> as bad as the psychologists. You know, they know nothing other than lecturing on the periodic table. Oh, there's got to be other ways to present the periodic table than a well honed lecture. But maybe those 20 minute summary places in between students' struggles. You know, what's the first column got in common, kids? What changes from one row to the next? And wait four seconds, right? The average amount of time a faculty member can wait between when a student asks, a, or when they ask a question of the class and the silence that they'll receive before they give the answer. And the students know it's four seconds. <laughs> and so they're waiting five because they know you're going to give them the answer. We don't. This is a great moment to break bad teaching habits. No more questions? Yeah. Well, I'd like to thank you for, for a great talk and I think it has been left a lot of people thinking and probably thinking forward about so. the future. Well, thank you very much.